Okay, good time. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's not the most powerful car here in the garage because this one is standing there. It's <laughs> not part of the program, but um, we have to confess that. Yeah, this is our new fire, new fire breaker. We have in the power range. 620 horsepower on 1360 kilo. That means uh, power to weight ratio like never before on a Porsche street legal car. So the most powerful and fastest Porsche ever built. Um, but it's not only the straight line performance that we were looking for. It's uh, even obvious that uh, with the GT cars and especially with the RS cars, we follow a different route. Uh, we want to have the best track cars available for track day, weekends, for uh, club sport races, and for the enthusiast who likes to enjoy racetrack uh, activities from uh, now and then. It's clearly that uh, we have a little bit of race of uh, Nürburgring, Nürburgring best record times uh, in the last couple of uh, years, months, and um, we have a, we have a, yeah, we have the, um, the attitude that we want to be best in that category because uh, this uh, RS kind of cars, this niche of cars, I think was created by Porsche, and so we uh, always want to be on pole position with the product uh, in that uh, in that regard. And um, I think we achieved it uh, very, very, very um, yeah, successfully with this car, which does the uh, Nürburgring notch life in 7, 18 seconds. And that's with a, with a driver who was not a professional race driver, who's one of our test drivers who knows the ring very, very well, <coughs> but who's not a professional race driver. And that shows something which is very, very important in that kind of cars. That's what we call the drivability. So um, not only professionals should be able to exploit all the full potential of the car, it has to be easy to drive at the limit, because that's the only way to go fast with the car, especially on track conditions. If you look at the car, it looks really fast, it looks really mean, and um, that's why it looks like a race car. Lots of uh, materials involved here are carbon fiber, as you can see. Uh, there's an extensive use on that of that material in one part. You can see it, on the other part it's painted, because this is carbon fiber too. So uh, we were able to take a lot of weight out of the body in white through the use of uh, lightweight materials uh, um, and suppliers that we know from our race car undergoing from the GT3 RSR for the RS Fiber project. Because as you might know, this car is developed by the same keep of engineers that are doing this car and the GT3 R cup cars, or the cup cars and the RSR cars. So the technology transfer from race to road takes place in the head of the people, not between departments. And this is the big advantage that we have in that car, that we have very fast reaction ways uh, in development. And the same enthusiastic uh, engineering team that develops race cars and road cars at the same time. And I think you can re really feel that on the product when you it drive later on. If we go a little bit more into, into detail about, um, well, let, let me put let me explain just another little bit of the history, how the project was, was born, because this was not a normal, normal um, procedure that the salespeople say, okay, we want a car like this because we think on the market there's a need for that. It was totally the other way around. But we were in development of the GT2 car, the normal GT2, which came out in 2000 and, what was it, five, five six? Um, well, I can't remember, I think it's for too long now for the GT2 997, um, we found that the car had huge potential on the track. It wasn't mean, meant as a, as, a, as a only track capable car, the GT2. It's kind of like a more like a business jet that's capable for the track use as well. But we found so much potential in the GT2 car that we said, okay, let's apply some RS technology to a GT2 car and, and, and look where does it lead us. And um, at the first it was really a secret project without our gang of maybe 10 or 15 engineers and uh, we had some money on the side from the GT2 project and, project and we uh, applied some GT3 parts, had some new ideas on the suspension and uh, we're building one demonstrator secretly. Nobody knew that so um, actually they could have fired us for that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when we were on the Nürburgring Notch Live we get, getting the official, uh, official lap times for the GT2 with Walter Röhr. Um, we had this car hidden away in a garage and that and Walter came back after a hot lap on the GT2, which was about 7.32, something like that. <coughs> he said, Walter, we have something else. Would you try it? Uh, and the garage door opened and there was a car that we called the Lighty, the GT2 Lighty. So the RS was not, was not uh, applied to the model um, in that early stage. 
<coughs> internally we called it the beast, yeah. because this car was, was so snappy, was so extraordinarily um, p uh, powerful that um, yeah, we really compared it to a little animal. And um, we had one GT2 that we lightened up by about 100 kilos, which is not feasible uh, in the real world because you have laws, you have crash laws, and all these different different things. Um, so we, we couldn't get the 100 kilo weight saving <coughs> on that on that car that is really homologated for street use. But um, back then we only had 560 horsepower because that was what we thought was the most we could extract out of the engine, which uh, was not true. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, and Walter did one fast lap and came, came back grinning totally and said, wow, and the lap was about 7.27. And uh, so, five seconds faster than on the GT2. And we said, okay, there's a lot of potential here, let's do that project. Went to the board, told the board, okay, we have a secret project here. We lift, we, we lift the, with the blanket, that is the car we want to build. Um, please let us do it. Uh, and they said, okay, do it. Uh, and we were aiming for a performance about 7.27, 7.25 on the Nürburgring notch life, and we ended up with 7.18 because everybody got so enthusiastic in the project, everybody had more ideas. Even the guys from the workshop yeah, could, could bring in their ideas. It was really a, a, a very, very a mixed team uh, that, uh, with the motorsports that were responsible for the car. Yeah, and the overall result is that, which we're very proud of. And um, we're very curious if there will be a car in the near future that could beat us on a notch life on, on that time and um, on lateral acceleration as well because this car does 0 to 100 and, um, 190 almost in 28 seconds. This is uh, like about 10 seconds faster as a turbo and uh, a lot faster than most of our competitors or all of our competitors as well, which makes the driving experience quite extraordinary. My colleague Jörg Jünger will uh, start to go a little bit more into detail what exactly did we change on the car to make it perform like this because this is what you guys want to write, this is what you want to know how did we transfer this wish yeah, into, into the flesh of the car Jörg Andreas has uh, mentioned it before, so we did everything to take out as much weight as possible so one example starting in the front example is the, the bonnet which is made of uh, carbon fiber and uh, this allows, compared to the, to the aluminium bonnet, to save more or less two and a half kilograms uh, only in this, in this part. And if you have a look at it, it's not some, let me say, some, some tuning part, <laughs> but it's something really special, uh, calculated, simulated for crash uh, requirements. So everything has been considered to be a very a real Porsche part. Besides the bonnet, as Andreas mentioned before, the fenders are made from uh, from carbon fiber too, and uh, this allows to save more or less five kilograms. And if you go a little bit to the, the rear of the car, you find a lot of other carbon fiber parts, which you have <coughs> here, for example, this part. We have the side inlets here for the for the air, which are made from carbon fiber. So everywhere where it was possible to to save weight, we we change the material. Another contribution for the weight saving are the windows. Both the rear windows and the rear side windows are made of plastic and compared to the, to the glass windows, for example, of the GT2, another four kilograms. So you see everything summing up the weight, uh, you really find a big, a big saving. Just to give you an idea of the overall weight, if you take into consideration the dry weight of this car, so without any kind of liquid, without fuel, we are more or less at 1,280 kilograms. And if you compare this to the weight of the GT3 Cup, so to a real race car, you see that we have only a difference of about 80 kilograms compared to a real race car. So this gives you an idea of the importance of the weight we have, uh, we have considered in this car. Um, let me give you some details, some information on, on the engine. 620 horsepower. It's the first uh, turbocharged RS Porsche has uh, realized as a production car. We have um, the intake manifold, which is partly made in, in plastic. Uh, the engine is equipped with a, with a single mass flywheel that allows to, um, to improve the revving up really an engine like a, like a race, uh, like a pure motorsport engine, 
uh, with a uh, immediate response when you um, when you when you use the car. Um, I think if I uh, just just make one remark to the, to the engine, um, we ourselves we are not the biggest turbo fans in motorsport to be honest, uh, because a more emotional engine is always the higher revving mm -hmm. atmospherical engine which gives you lots of RPMs, lots of bites, lots of instantaneous response. But in this case, I must say, uh, we tried all we could uh, to make a turbo engine feel a little bit like a race atmospherical engine. So with the lower weight masses, the rotating masses of the flywheel, which is even lighter than the version we use on the GT3 RS, um, and all the mechanical changes we had in the, in, in the car, so we have diff different rotating assembly, for example, in comparison to the induction system is different. All these all the, all this measurements, including the ECU and the turbocharger, um, we ended up with the engine that only revs, only revs up to about 7,000, but the way it's reacting, even in non-boost mode, you know, way down below the rev range, is really much more like a race car than any other turbo engine we ever had. And this makes us especially proud because you can drive this engine almost like an atmospherical engine. If you go path throttle to the, to the highest RPM and, and uh, to the highest uh, torque RPM and then, and, and, and then floor the floor, the engine, it really explodes and it's so much fun. So I, I, presu I personally, I, I never could believe that I would enjoy driving a turbo that much than in that case. So it's a, it's a lot of engineering for the emotional side as well included in that, in that power plant. Yeah, that was One big contribution to this uh, specific or to this special feeling when you drive the car is uh, in fact the, um, the intake system. Normally when you talk about a natural aspirator engine, you use a resonance, uh, a resonance system in order to, uh, to push as much air or to get as much air in the cylinders as possible. In this case, we have an expansion system, so it's uh, nearly the, the, the contrary, it's a different thinking. And the, the, the reason for this kind of, um, of intake system is that uh, it's possible to uh, decrease, to reduce the temperature of the air in a very significant way. So you, you get the air inside, you get cooler air inside. And in order to compensate the lack of, of, uh, of air mass, you can increase or you compensate it by increasing the boost pressure. So this can be done. And in the end, you have a, a more powerful engine by, by this, uh, using this kind of intake system. And because of what? Cooler air means more oxygen mm -hmm. in the air. So more reactive components in the air to, that you can use for the combustion.